well, he said, well, what if we lose body fat? Can we reverse it? And he conducted a series of studies, counterpoint, counterbalance, the direct trial. Uh, and most recently, I can't remember what it was called, but it was in normal weight people. Um, so people who weren't overweight, but they still had type 2 diabetes. And across the board, he showed that the mo that losing body fat reversed diabetes. And their diabetes stayed gone even when they reintroduce carbohydrates into the diet, so long as they didn't regain body fat. And the only people who this didn't benefit were people who had had diabetes for so long, they did have pancreatic damage. And in this case, it was simply because they're, they're not producing in, they're insulin. They're kind of like have a pseudo type one diabetes. And so they're going to have blood glucose problems when they eat carbohydrates again, because their pancreas is failing them. Um, and, and so, you know, there's hands down, uh, losing body fat is the number one thing you can do to improve your metabolic health. It directly addresses the fundamental drivers of insulin resistance and diabetes. And it doesn't matter how you lose that body fat. If you eat keto, if you eat high carbohydrate, it doesn't matter. Um, the end result's the same because it's excessive body fat that drives like this domino effect that leads the body to become metabolically unhealthy. So question one, do you believe that there's a diet that can be high insulin but will succeed at lowering body fat? Yes, because insulin... Insulin as a result of eating will not be elevated all the time. Okay, let me change it then. Let's just say a high fasting insulin diet. Yeah, well, the people in these studies with type 2 diabetes have high fasting insulin and they diet, they lose body fat. Um, and Do you know offhand what their fasting insulin was? Above 50, I want to say. Um, Above but 50 milli IU? Really? Yes. Uh, oh. I think... Um, but I'm sure it, it, it varied from study to study too. Uh, but yeah, there was in his very first um, study, the, the counterpoint study, uh, he did eight weeks of a very low calorie diet. You know, uh, these people just drank shakes with some carb, fat, and protein. I suspect if it's very low calorie, they would have lower fasting insulin. Or let me put it this way. I would expect the trend for fasting insulin to be lower and lower. So you, okay. So you're talking about if they have high fasting insulin while they're dieting, right? Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't even know if so this isn't me trying to advance a particular model. Yeah. I'm just stating, I do agree with, and I'm actually picking this up from Ben Bickman. I do agree that any diet that's going to ultimately be successful for weight loss is a low insulin diet. This is not me making a case for carbohydrates per se, but insulin is the central anabolic hormone in our body, right? If you have a 12 hour fasted period, I expect it to be low if, you ex if you're expecting to lose weight. Yeah, I think I see what you're saying. And I, so I, so the question, there's two kinds of things that are going around in my head. And the first one is, well, if insulin is high, um, you know, what, what is it that's making it chronically high to begin with? If it's insulin resistance, then even though you have high levels of insulin, the signal that insulin's able to transmit isn't high because your cells aren't picking up on it. So this is, it doesn't matter in, in a sense. Um, now, what about a situation where uh, you have normal insulin sensitivity, but you have chronically high insulin levels. And I don't know if that scenario exists. Well, I, I mean, it, it, it could happen, for example, with a type one diabetic overdosing on exogenous insulin. Yeah. Right? But exogenous insulin, I, I don't think is applicable at all to normal physiology. Right. But you see where I'm going with this is yeah. obviously you could become hypoglycemic and pass out yeah. right, from an overexposure of insulin in the periphery. Well, I, so if you're, 
I, I think insulin can stop fat loss regardless of energy balance. Um, and I say that primarily because uh, in, in order to discover the essential fatty acids, um, researchers had to feed high carbohydrate like shakes to participants every two hours to keep their insulin elevated. Because what they realized is that uh, if you take out all essential fatty acids from the diet, there's still a bunch stored in their body fat that can uh, you know, prevent a deficiency for a long time until they've wasted away. Uh, so they needed to keep all that fat trapped in their fat cells. Um, so, but, and, and so if you take like someone with type one diabetes and they're injecting or even type two diabetes, let's say, and they're injecting insulin because maybe their own pancreas isn't pumping out enough. Um, I, I would think that it could inhibit fat loss, but I, I, I'm not sure it would be able to stop it. Um, and I would actually be really interested in seeing a study on this, uh, because I think it's a good question. Um, I would, like I said, I would at least stick by the trend. It may be true that there is a level of insulin resistance during the process of fat loss for which it would be higher than what we would expect in a metabolically healthy population. Totally agree on that. But I, I do believe that you need to get fasted insulin lower. And I'll reassert this. This is not me saying you can't have a diet that has carbohydrates. But when you're talking about a caloric deficit, that's another means of which to get to a lower fasted insulin because the area under the curve is still going to be lower. Right. Okay. Um, well, I guess my question would be, what's the point of looking like of the fasted insulin? Like, it, you know, we, we could agree. We could say, okay, fasted insulin does need to drop to lose body fat, but that's going to happen when you create an energy deficit. So it, it just, it doesn't seem like an important variable uh, off the top of my head because it's, it's not something you have control over. What you do have control over is what you eat. And if you eat any diet that puts you in an energy deficit and it drops fasting insulin, then it just kind of goes back to the main point where you need to diet and, and lose body fat, even if part of that effect is mediated by the fasting insulin going down from the energy deficit. I, I definitely think you have control over insulin area under the curve. I, th I think that you could be on a low carb diet and ultimately end up with lower net insulin levels. Yes. This is not to say that you can't over consume on a low carb diet. I think you can, by the way, <laughs> right? But to get us to that place where we might actually have a disagreement, because we have plenty of overlap here, right? The, the, and this is why I really want to connect these two dots for you, okay. Alex. So this guy here, right? This is a, this is a lipoprotein. This is where those triglycerides came from that got into the fat cell, right? We agree on that? There, okay, if we want to get extra technical, <laughs> if we want to get extra technical, there is such a thing as uh, de novo lipogenesis in fat cells, right? Yeah. But predominantly in the sac, the vast majority of triglycerides originated from an ApoB lipoprotein. Mm -hmm. Do we agree on that? Yes. And when those cells are too full, they're not accepting anything. What then happens to these lipid-rich ApoB lipoproteins? Hmm. I would argue they hang out longer. They're, they're not finding parking spaces for their triglycerides. Yeah. So you have more of these triglyceride-rich VLDLs. That means there's going to be higher levels of triglycerides in the blood because mm -hmm. they're, they're not finding where they can put it. The ectopic fat that gets developed. Why? Because... We're reaching a threshold where they're now hypertriglyceridemic. There's so much that's roaming around. They're like, we got to put it somewhere because there's scarce space in, yeah. in the circulature. So we got to plug it somewhere, right? But the problem is this not getting turned over, the triglycerides not getting turned over, or the reason why the HDL cholesterol is lower because it's a marker of turnover. Mm -hmm. That's why lean mass hyperresponders have ridiculously high HDL, I would argue. 
because their turnover of triglycerides off of ApoB lipoproteins is so rapid that it bumps up the HDL cholesterol because the okay. HDL particle species yeah. is higher. And the reason this is so important is because lean mass hyperresponders are both metabolically healthy and run relatively at lower fasting insulin levels. But here's where it gets interesting. They have a high quantity of free fatty acids in their area under the curve. So at any point in time, and, and I can show this with my own blood work, I actually have a lot of NIFAs, non-esterified fatty acids, mm -hmm. that are circulating in any, any given time. And my triglycerides are higher relatively following meal times because the insulin is not putting them away as quickly. It's more acting on the glucose than it is on the fat. But you have a scenario that you don't normally see in the literature, which is the triglycerides will be low when I'm fasting, but yet my free fatty acids will be higher. Yeah. And that gets back to the Randall cycle. So the Randall cycle you were describing has to do with how glucose is competing with fat within the cell, yeah, right? And if there's more free fatty acids inside the cell, the cell's not dumb. It goes, oh, well, we're more fat adapted. I guess there's a greater abundance of fat. Let's spare out the glucose and leave it there for the obligate cells, like, like red blood cells, like mm -hmm. erythrocytes, right? I think if you're in a scenario where you have a lot of fuel in your bloodstream, that's a huge sign right there and especially if it's triglycerides. Getting back to the personal fat threshold, I agree. If you have high triglycerides and low HDL, it's probably going to precede full-blown type two diabetes. Yeah. And you should pay close attention to that, Yeah. right? Yes. But that's why all of this comes full circle. What, what I love about this is, Alex, what you're describing to me is one dot over here and this other dot, and, and you said this offline before we started, you're comfortable saying, I don't know when it comes to yeah. lipids for the things we may be getting into. But I wanna connect these two dots for you as to why you want to care so much about seeing these ApoB lipoproteins when they're getting processed properly. Because if they're succeeding, if it's a success cycle of putting those triglycerides away, of course, I wanna see how much those adipocytes, those fat cells, when they're healthy, and showcasing that in the lipid profile does not associate with a higher level of atherosclerosis with plaque development in the arteries, right? Yeah, so I mean, I like the research question. Um, and, you know, a, a big thing that, that I, I say frequently, and I'm pretty sure in our recent Twitter discussion, I might've said it to you too, but heart disease and atherosclerosis is multifactorial there's a lot of different things that contribute to its development and progression 